Thank you, Steve. Paul's, Paul's letter to the Romans uh, has a number of interesting and kind of controversial verses in it. Today I'm going to be looking at one of those. Now, I've summarized the problem by contrasting actions and words. Paul talks about a God who seems to say one thing and do another. So the question is, what's, what's God really like? And I'd like to begin the discussion by looking at Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Yeah, I wrote 16 there, but it's really 18. You can check me out. <laughs> uh, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. The wrath of God... Now, we don't use the word wrath very often anymore. Uh, kind of carries the connotation of being super angry. Uh, the first definition in the dictionary is strong, vengeful anger. And the second definition is retributory punishment. That is, they're going to make somebody pay for what they've done wrong. It's related to the English word writhe, uh, which means to squirm in pain. When we have wrath, we want to make somebody else writhe in pain. And so, what does Paul mean when he talks about the wrath of God? One common understanding is that God's really angry at all the bad stuff that people do. He's going to make them writhe in pain as a punishment for all their bad stuff. Uh, people are doing all sorts of wicked things. God's really angry about it. And he's going to do something about it. As some bumper stickers have said, Jesus is coming back, and boy, is he mad. <laughs> well, how mad is he? Uh, Paul says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Well, what's being revealed about the wrath of God? What is God going to do in his wrath? And that kind of leads to a bit of a puzzle. Uh, because Paul doesn't actually say much about what God is going to do to people who do wickedness. Another question is, uh, what's this got to do with the gospel? Uh, as we can see in the introduction to the letter, Paul's letter to the Romans is about the gospel. It's about good news, not bad news. Uh, he announces in verse 16 that the gospel is about salvation. Uh, so why is he starting out with the wrath of God? It doesn't sound very good. <laughs> Well, we can explore those. Uh, first, uh, let's see what Paul says God is going to do in his wrath. Uh, we can start here in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and wickedness. God is angry at the bad stuff that people do. And as theologians pointed out, we, we should expect a good God to be angry about bad stuff. When we see genocide like the Hutus massacring the Tutis in Rwanda, or there are massacres in Cambodia, or in a school in Connecticut. It's right for us to be angry about that. It's reasonable for us to expect God to be angry about it too. If we saw one of our children inflicting pain on the other for no reason at all, it would be right for us to be angry about it. We should have a strong moral dislike of cruelty and other wickedness. And Paul is saying that God is angry about stuff like that. And of course, we can see that without the gospel. That's part of the moral fabric of society. It's revealed from heaven to all people all around the world. You don't have to be a Christian to be angry about senseless killing and atrocities. That's part of what we might call natural revelation. As verse 19 says, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. And Paul isn't talking specifically about Jews or Christians. He's talking about all peoples. Verse 20. Ever since the creation of the world, His eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things He has made. And so they're without excuse. 
The Psalms say, the heavens declare the glory of God. The universe gives evidence that there's a creator. In the social world, we can see evidence with our own eyes that cruelty and murder are wrong. People all around the world have some kind of sense of right and wrong, and they get angry when other people do wrong. And if God is good, he's going to be angry about it too. So Paul says here in verse 20 that they are without excuse. Even if they don't know much about right and wrong, everybody does something, even by their own definition, is wrong. Evil isn't just a problem out there of other people. The problem of evil is also in us, every one of us. Paul makes that clear in chapter 3, that everybody has sinned, everybody's done something wrong. In verse 21, he focuses on the sins of the Gentiles. Uh, he'll get to Jews in the next chapter, but right here he's looking at all the others, and he says, For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. What, what Paul is writing here is similar to a Jewish book of the first century before Christ. It's called the Book of Wisdom. It was apparently a common view of Jews at the time that Gentiles really ought to know better. And they had a chance to know better, but they turned away from it. They turned away from what God had revealed to them, and as a result, their minds were darkened. They found it harder and harder to understand what was right and what was wrong. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. They invented their own gods. Some of them looked like human beings, like the Greek and Roman gods. Uh, others looked like animals, like we can see in Egypt or Canaan. And some people even worshipped snakes and crocodiles. Uh, they got further and further away from the truth. And if your God is a crocodile, uh, you aren't going to see much good ethics there. <laughs> uh, that's not a good basis for relationships. Your mind is going to be darkened. Uh, although you might be really good at building pyramids, uh, you're going to be missing out on something important about what it means to be a human being. So people turned away from God, and they ended up doing wicked things. And we should expect God to be angry about that. They're hurting themselves, as well as other people. And verse 24 tells us what God did about it. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves. God was so angry that he abandoned them to let them fend for themselves. Uh, look, he says, if, if you don't want me in your life, then I'll just let you go away and suffer the consequences. Just do the stupid stuff you want to do. See how you like it. If you want impurity, then have at it. And Paul gives a reason in verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. God turned them over to the lusts of their hearts because they had chosen to reject him and embrace something that wasn't true. Crocodiles and animals aren't gods, but if you want to worship them, well, go ahead. <laughs> See what good it does you. If you want to worship the gods and goddesses of Greece when they can't even get along with each other, then go ahead. See what kind of life that gives you. It doesn't make any sense. But if you can't see that, maybe you need to experience it for a while to start to understand how foolish that is. The false gods are going to give you bad results. But if that's what you want to do, I'll let you do it for a while. But it doesn't just stop there. Verse, verse 26 tells us, For this reason God gave them up to degrading passions, they had rejected God and God's purpose for human life, so God's uh, let them get worse and worse. And just like the Jewish book of wisdom, Paul used this example of sexual immorality. 
Jews often criticized other people for two main sins, and they thought that one led to the other. Idolatry led to sexual immorality. <coughs> Paul echoes that here when he says that God gave them up to degrading passions. Verses 26 and 27. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way also the men, giving up natural intercourse with women, they were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. So we see here that God lets people do what they want so they'll experience the results. Homosexuality is just one example. Uh, Paul could easily talk about the due penalty for adultery or pornography or all sorts of other ways, wrong ways of using sex. Uh, Paul is just using one example here that he know, you know, he's pretty sure his audience is going to agree with. Nowadays, he might have to use a different ex example, maybe pedophilia. Uh, but the principle is still the same. People reject God. They end up doing wrong things. God lets them suffer the natural consequences of what they've done. And in verse 28, Paul, for the third time, says it. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. God let them have it by letting them do it. If that's what you want to do, then okay. Try it out for a while, see what happens. And later I'll come back and ask, how's it working for you? In verses 29 to 31, he explains some more of the results. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters. I'm going to read this fast. Uh, he's, he's just reading a, a, a huge list of things that go wrong when people reject God. And we could spend a lot of time on each of these to say, oh, what does this word mean? What? But they're all examples. The point is, the major point is, that all these things go wrong once people have rejected the author and the source of life. Uh, they end up being inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And basically, everybody has done it. There is no society on earth in which there is no envy, strife, gossip, pride, and so forth. You know, the Jews like to point their fingers at idolatry and sexual immorality, but they had problems of their own. Coveting, bo boasting, gossip. It's all part of the same package of problems. And all this is under the heading of God's wrath. Uh, so we come back to the original question. What does God do in His wrath? What we see revealed in nature, and what we see in this chapter of Romans is that God lets people do the sins they want to do. The wrath of God, as Paul describes it here, is basically a hands-off approach. There might be some future judgment, future punishment too, but Paul isn't saying anything about it here. He, he can present the good news of Jesus without having to threaten anybody with future punishment. The present is bad enough. All he's saying here is when people run away from God and they construct their own societies, they don't do a very good job of it. When we try to run our own lives, we don't do a very good job of it. And Paul concludes in verse 32, They know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. Yet, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. People know well, at least they're capable of knowing, that this approach to life doesn't produce the sort of relationships that we would like to last forever and ever. Everybody's done something wrong. And nobody can claim that the universe is obligated to give them eternal life. And of course, everybody does, in fact, die. 
And it's against this backdrop that Paul is presenting good news. He's saying it's evident just by looking around us that strife and envy and murder are wrong, and yet that's the direction that humanity is going. There's a breakdown in social values and relationships. We've got trouble, serious trouble, and that's why we need to be saved. If we weren't in trouble, we wouldn't need to be rescued. But we are in trouble, and Jesus has, in fact, rescued us. He'll get to that a little bit later. So we're, we are already addressing our second question. What does this have to do with the gospel? Uh, we can go back to verses 16 uh, through 19 to see how Paul connects it. Uh, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17 it begins with the word for, but we could also say because. Because in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Then verse 18, it also starts with the word for indicating that Paul's giving a reason. Because the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness. We can shorten these verses a little bit to see how they're connected. Verse 16, the, the gospel is the power of God for salvation because the gospel reveals the righteousness of God because the wrath of God has already been revealed. Oh. Maybe we could paraphrase it a little more. We need some good news because we can already see the bad news all around us. The good news tells us how God sent Jesus to rescue us from the mess that we're in. Now, if you don't think humanity has, doesn't have problems, or if you think that we can fix these problems by your, uh, ourselves, uh, then you probably aren't ready to listen to the gospel. Uh, if you think that humanity knows how to live forever in peace and kindness, I think you're denying the obvious. Uh, we've got some serious problems, and Paul says that the gospel tells us about God's solution to the problems. But we've got kind of a, a logical problem here, a, a conceptual problem, and that's what kind of God are we dealing with? On top of that formula, he's got salvation. In the middle, he's got righteousness. On the bottom, he's got wrath. But the common concept of salvation doesn't seem to work very well with this common concept of wrath. We can put the question like this. Does God want to punish people? Or does he want to save them? <coughs> I'm not sure how other Christians would answer that question. <laughs> Uh, many Christians seem to want to have it both ways. I don't see how it can be both ways. Uh, they might say that Jesus is trying to rescue us from the Father's wrath. But the Bible is pretty clear that the Father wants to rescue us just as much as Jesus does. But does that mean he's trying to rescue us from his own punishment? That makes him sound kind of confused. <laughs> and it's really hard to say that he wants to punish us. To put it into a modern context, we might create a parable. And I, I call it the parable of the angry prison warden. Once upon a time, there was a maximum security prison filled with all kinds of rapists, murderers, and drug dealers. And they were all on death row, sentenced to death. But... This is America. It was taking a really long time for their cases to be heard. And nobody had been put to death for a really long time. The prison warden was really angry about this. He was angry that the crimes were not being punished. He was so angry that he took matters into his own hands. He started outside the prison and dug a tunnel into the prison and helped everyone get out. He even gave them a key to his own home so they would have a good place to live. And the question is, how angry was the prison warden? And I think we'd have to say, not very angry at all. The parable called him angry, but his actions spoke louder than the words we gave. 
The extent of his anger has to be determined by what he actually did. And I think that's true of God. People might say that God is angry about sin, but we have to ask the question of what God actually does in his anger. We can't assume his anger is just like ours. We have to see what he actually does. And we see in Jesus that God wants to rescue us. But why is Paul talking about the wrath of God? I think we're seeing here a bit of rhetorical strategy. There were some people arguing against Paul, saying that Paul was too soft on sin, that Paul was saying that mm, grace just means God lets everybody do what they want. And they were the hardline people who said that God is angry about the sins of the Gentiles and he's going to punish them all. So Paul says, well, you want me to talk, talk about the wrath of God? Okay, I can do that. People are rejecting God and getting into all sorts of sins. But what does God do about it? He lets them do whatever they want. Anybody looking around the world can see that much. It's not some newfangled idea about grace that lets people do whatever they want. God's been doing that all along. It's God's idea, not Paul's. But, but what about the penalty of sin? Isn't God going to punish everybody who does wrong? Well, yes, he is. But at least for now, he does it by letting people suffer the natural consequences of their sins. Sin has its own punishment. And the gospel reveals that God wants to rescue people from that punishment. He's not trying to rescue people from his own wrath. He's trying to rescue them from the results of their own sins. There are a couple of additional factors here that Paul will explain in more detail later in the letter. At first, that everybody has sinned, and if God wanted to punish sinners, then that means he's going to have to punish absolutely everybody. That's kind of a dismal concept of God. Uh, the second factor is that everybody is a victim of sin, and not just a perpetrator of sin. Sin is a power that enslaves people, and we all need to be rescued from it. Paul is saying, you want to talk about the wrath of God? Here is what God in his wrath is doing. He's letting us all suffer from the consequences of our bad choices. If that doesn't sound a lot like wrath, maybe it's because we have mislabeled God as being full of wrath. We've got the wrong word for what he's doing. Sure, God's angry about sin, and people have willingly gone astray and gotten worse and worse, but that doesn't mean that God wants to punish them. The truth is that he wants to rescue them from the mess they've gotten themselves into. Paul has used the word for wrath, but by explaining what God does, he's drained part of the meaning out of that word so we can see what God actually does. In his wrath. Now, one interesting thing about the Greek word for wrath is that it doesn't always mean anger. It means a strong emotion. Most of the time, it does mean anger, but here it seems to mean something else. God has strong emotions about us. And what does he do with those strong emotions? We can't assume that he wants to punish, because in his actions, he shows something very different. He sends Jesus to rescue us from the mess that we're in. The gospel reveals salvation to us because God in his righteousness wants to rescue us from the kingdom of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of light and love. And what does it mean for you, for me? Are there evils inside of us? Is there any envy any pride, any gossip, <clears throat> or strife. We are part of the problem. If we're part of humanity, we're part of the problem. We're trapped in this prison of sin, uh, enslaved by sin, partly by our own choice and partly by circumstances that we had no control over. Uh, we are on death row in a prison filled with people deserving of death. 
And the good news is that the prison warden has built a tunnel into our prison so that we can escape. He not only wants to let us out of prison, but he gives us the key to his own home so that we'll have a place to live. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the rescue you provide. All of us have suffered from our own sins and the sins of other people. And we look forward to the complete deliverance that you have promised. And we know that you are delivering us even now. And we pray for your spirit to work within our hearts to help us continue to change from what we were to what you originally intended for us. Thank you for Jesus who has led the way, who has made the sacrifice, who leads us even now. Thank you for the spirit who changes us, transforms us from the inside out by the renewing of our minds that we might become closer to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.